point, no, a point of order from Sue Moroney. Thank you, um, Mr Chair. At the outset of this debate, and I'm talking about yesterday's outset of this debate, we were given assurances by the, um, the, the person in the chair that if there were reasonable questions put to the minister, that um, those questions would be addressed. I, what I really want to just check is because the, the minister in the chair is not the minister in charge of the bill, no, whether, that's not whether a point that of will order. still occur. No, no. Member it will, won't? The member will sit. No. Um, when I say no, I mean no, the member will sit. <coughs> the minister and the chair will decide whether he or she wishes to answer the questions. It's not for the presiding officer, the chair, to decide whether the minister and the chair answers questions. So that's the prerogative of the minister, and that's where it stands. Yesterday we saw the minister in charge of the bill take five calls on part one, but that's not to say that ministers in the future will actually uh, take, uh, take as many calls. That's their prerogative, and there's nothing in standing orders or speaking rulers that requires the minister and the chair to actually uh, answer the questions. I'm going to call Jonathan Young. Thank you. So, no, it's another point of order. Is this a new point of order? It, it is. You? It is a new point of order. New, I, new because, point of order, Because Sue I think you, you may have misunderstood what I was asking about. Um, the, the direction given at the beginning of this debate was around um, the, uh, the way in which the chair would, uh, would assess um, closure motions with no, regard no, to that issue. The member will sit. I've already answered this question. Closure motions happen when the presiding officer determines that the debate has run its full course. Whether the minister has participated in that or not, that's a matter for the presiding officer to determine. I'm calling Jonathan Young. Thank you, sir. Sir, just in response to Mr Farfoy's uh, question, my view as we look at part three, which is headed worker engagement, participation and representation, is that there is, I think, some muddling and confusion taking place because the bill talks about workplace representation, and that's the principle. A mechanism of that is a health and safety representative. The task force, the independent task force, said this. Active worker participation means that workers are involved in developing, implementing and monitoring their workplace's health and safety systems and can participate through a range of representation mechanisms. A range of representation mechanisms. And so if a PCBU, an employer, works alongside workers in their business and they stop, it could be a toolbox meeting, it could be a staff meeting, and they say, they say, Today we are going to look at any potential hazards to what we're going to be doing. And what do you see? And that worker is engaged in a dialogue and together they are identifying any potential hazards. That is workplace representation. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. This is workplace representation. I think that members on the other side are locked in to a particular form, a particular process, whereas what we understand, sir, is that in order to, as the, my colleague spoke about, in terms of bringing a culture change, it's enabling every person who's in the workplace to have their view expressed. And they do that through their participation, through the engagement process that is very much heart of this legislation. So what is being watered down through this debate is actually the onus on engagement and participation. And everybody is looking at this thing that the only way it can happen, and I am not denying that it is a mechanism, is through the health and safety representative. Now, we're not denying that because the Minister yesterday identified 75% of the workforce, those with, uh, I guess, organisations or companies over the number of 20, and those under who work in high hazard industries, can, 
uh, will must, if they are asked to have a health and safety representative, they must do so. And so we do acknowledge that health and safety representatives can play a part in those businesses, but they are not essential in small businesses and low-risk areas for that worker engagement and participation to take place. We are just being reasonably practicable, which is a term that this bill has in the very essence of it. And going back to Mr C.O. Williams' uh, uh, comments when he questioned that term, didn't like that term reasonably practicable, of course that term is in present legislation, it's in the uh, health and safety and employment legislation 1992. It's very much part of the way in which the workplace already operates using those terms. And uh, practicable means that which is reasonably doable. So it actually has it actually has an implication that there needs to be actions put in place. Sir, so when we look at this culture change, I think it is very, very important to understand that no two businesses are essentially the same. And there will be ways and means by which one business can have a very effective health and safety regime that does not apply to another. Sir, so it is the outcome it is the outcome that is incredibly important. And what this bill offers is flexibility for firms and organisations right across this country when we want to see complete engagement by the workforce and, and by uh, organisations and businesses. There needs to be a certain... I'm going to call...